Number 1. The child was naked and abandoned in death left face up under overhanging brush near a nameless bog, down behind a shots and beer rental hall. The pink t-shirt and purple shorts that she'd worn to a playground were laid beside her bruised body. Michelle Norris had struggled in her seven years, a shy girl who grew up in poverty and neglect. Then, she suffered a death that has haunted this tight-knit city for 31 years. The person who raped and murdered her over Memorial Day weekend in 1988 has never been caught. Now, investigators believe Michelle's last breaths might contain clues to her killer. Detective Jeffrey Arajo said the debris Michelle inhaled as she was forced face down and suffocated didn't match the soil where she was found. No one, it seems, ever asked why. It's been assumed for 31 years that she died there, Arajo said recently. Now, we're looking at another angle that maybe she didn't. The FBI crime lab that did the geologic testing back then had determined that Michelle had inhaled primarily masses of mineral wool insulation type material, fiberglass and botanical material, according to court records. Not a bog. A building. This evidence, little noticed at the time and never made public, is now bringing an old case into focus. Investigators recently collected soil samples from the basement of a century-old apartment house where Michelle's father lived in May 1988. William Darrell Norris, 59, who was separated from Michelle's mother at the time, skipped out of Rhode Island six months after the girl's death. The couple later divorced. Norris was one of several persons of interest identified by investigators over the years, and he has given different accounts of his actions when his daughter disappeared. One thing that's unchanged. Norris is the last person known to have seen Michelle alive. Michelle was a timid girl from a rough and tumble home, the third of four children and the only daughter of Norris, known by his middle name, and his wife, Julia Tager. The couple had married young and separated early, their lives troubled by alcoholism and physical abuse. The children lived with their mother on Summer Street, and their father moved in with his mother a few streets away. Michelle had a horrible life, said Arajo, the detective. She was sometimes dirty and hungry, he said, left with her siblings to forage for any food their chronically ill mother left in the refrigerator. It got that bad because I was very sick, Julia Tager Norris said. I was struggling. I couldn't get out of bed. A tip about neglect led state child welfare officials to remove the children from their mother's custody and place them with their maternal grandparents on Kendall Street on May 27, 1988. Michelle vanished the next day from a playground within view of her grandparents' apartment. She was with her brothers and cousins behind the Captain G. Harold Hunt School, where she attended first grade, when the older children went to the nearby store for candy. Michelle stayed behind with her four-year-old brother and a five-year-old cousin. Then, she was gone. Her grandmother later told reporters that she realized Michelle was missing when she called the children for dinner a few hours later. Her uncle searched for Michelle, even checking with Norris, who said he hadn't seen her. Her family reported her missing, telling police that Michelle would have gone only with someone she trusted. Central Falls wasn't a place where children disappeared easily. Tenements and triple-deckers elbow against each other, with windows like eyes on the narrow streets. Generations of immigrants have interwoven their lives within the city's one-square-mile borders. Everybody knew everyone back then, said retired police chief Joseph Moran, who grew up on Hunt Street. The city was popping with crime in the mid-1980s, when it was dubbed the cocaine capital of the Northeast by the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration, stretching the few dozen officers. But underneath the danger, the city's children roamed with ease. There were sports and the community center, playgrounds and postage stamp front yards, in tight neighborhoods where there always seemed to be someone watching. It was real safe, Moran said. In the months before Michelle's disappearance, however, the sense of safety began to turn, as one child after another in Rhode Island vanished and turned up dead. Frankie Barnes, 9, riding his bicycle in Providence that November. Jason Wolfe, 6, checking his family's mailbox in Providence in December. Christine Cole, 10, walking to a store in Pawtucket in January 1988. Justin C. Ellenwood, 9, dead in a brook near his home in Warwick, after disappearing in April. The killers of Frankie, Jason, and Justin were soon caught, but police were stymied by the murder of Christine, who
whose body washed up onto Kanimikut Point in Warwick in late February. And then, Michelle the fifth child in seven months. Decades before Jeffrey Arajo was the detective investigating the Norris case, he was a 13-year-old boy whose parents were already warning him about the scary people out there when Michelle disappeared. They lived in neighboring Lincoln and knew her large extended family his cousin was best friends with one of her uncles. When Michelle went missing, it was a big deal he said. Fear spread. The state police and FBI agents joined the investigation. Then on the afternoon of May 30, a firefighter recruit helping search a wooded section bordered by Higginson Avenue found Michelle's body. Down behind the old bug club, she lay like a discarded doll along a trail used by people going drinking or fishing. A medical examiner determined that Michelle had been raped and suffocated. Revealed in recent court documents. Her injuries also showed sexual assault had been a chronic occurrence in her short life. The city reeled. We always wondered, as we have for 31 years, who did this to her? Arajo said. Cold cases are difficult. Memories fade. Witnesses die. Evidence can be damaged or lost. Interviews weren't often recorded, making it difficult to analyze what was said and how. Central Falls also spent years teetering on the edge of financial insolvency, toppling into bankruptcy in 2011, which meant far fewer officers and resources in a city busy with crime. The police found other ways to keep the investigation going. As head of detectives and later as chief, Moran invited retired officers to collaborate with the newer detectives. None could forget the case of Michelle Norris. It's pretty much been the black sheep of this department because no one finished it, said Arajo, who joined the department 19 years ago and became a detective in 2005. Arajo brought it with him in April to a cold case homicide conference in Albany, New York. That's where Pawtucket detective Sue Cormier introduced him to an expert in criminology from Australia. David Keatley is chairman of crime science at Murdoch University School of Law and director of an international research network, Researchers in Behavior Sequence Analysis. Keatley focuses on behavior and patterns in a criminal's life history and the way they operate. By noting consistencies and inconsistencies in the behavior and testimony of witnesses and suspects, Keatley said, he can give the police some insight into the type of offender they're seeking and other crimes the person may have committed. Arajo said that meeting with Keatley and Cormier led to new steps in Michelle's case. He would not give specifics, but said the connection was a tipping point. When he returned to Central Falls, Arajo was thinking about how the soil collected from the crime scene in 1988 didn't match the debris that Michelle inhaled. Arajo wanted to know why. He turned his attention from the soil to the debris in the girl's lungs. On April 25, two days before what would have been Michelle's 38th birthday, he obtained a search warrant to collect samples from the basement of the apartment house where her father used to live. In his affidavit, Arajo wrote that the bog where Michelle was found could be a secondary crime scene. It would be important to consider if Michelle was possibly murdered somewhere else he wrote. Where? At the residence of her father. When her maternal uncles first began looking for Michelle, Norris told them he hadn't seen her, and, Arajo says now, he didn't seem interested in finding her. But after her body was found, Norris told police that he last saw Michelle at the playground, according to court records. Later, he told police that he took her to the store to buy candy, then returned her to the playground, according to the affidavit. No one saw them return. In 1999, while in custody for failing to pay nearly $60,000 in child support, Norris was questioned again. This time, Norris said Michelle asked to stay with him at his mother's apartment, but he changed his mind on the way there because of the state child welfare investigation and returned her to her grandparents' home on Kendall Street, according to the affidavit. Under further questioning, Norris began to get stressed, stretched his arms wide out, took a deep breath, and asked for a lawyer. In 2011, Norris was living in Florida when Arajo and Detective Craig Viennes flew down to question him again. Norris admitted that he had been touching Michelle, starting when she was five, according to the affidavit. In the three and a half hours they spoke to him, Daryl never denied killing Michelle, but only kept stating that he didn't remember, Arajo wrote. While forensic soil analysis is in common, it's a tool to help determine where a crime occurred, said Dennis Hilliard, 
the director of the Rhode Island State Crime Laboratory at the University of Rhode Island. Soil is not as specific as fingerprints, which are unique to the individual, but it can yield clues about geographic location, said Jim Turen, assistant state soil scientist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Warwick. For example, the soil in Rhode Island's East Bay has a different mineral structure than that in Newport or in the western part of the state. Eventually, scientists will classify the urban soil of cities in Rhode Island. But back in the 1980s, investigators were still learning about how forensic soil analysis could help them solve crimes. In Michelle's case, they collected soil samples from under her body and the surrounding area. The FBI found that it wasn't a match in 1988, and that's where it was left. Now the FBI is analyzing the samples from the basement and comparing it with the debris that Michelle inhaled. The results are pending. William Daryl Norris knows he's a suspect in his daughter's murder. I reckon I've always been, Norris says over the phone from Lake City, Florida, early Sunday afternoon. It's been a long time, almost 30 years. Dot 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 they didn't need to tell me. I figured it out. When a little girl from the next county disappeared sometime in 2005 or 2006, Norris said, Florida sheriffs wanted his DNA. He gave it up but suspected the Central Falls police were behind that too. They have my DNA, they have my set of fingerprints, they have the whole nine yards, he said. And I'm still sitting here, drinking. Norris said he picked up Michelle at the playground that day. I was going to bring her to my mom's, but we were going fishing the next morning, he said. Instead, Norris said, he brought Michelle to the store to get some chewing gum, then back to her grandparents' house on Kendall Street all in about 20 minutes or so. He said he was kind of drunk at the time, but remembered dropping her off and then going to a bar. He doesn't explain why this memory is different from what he told the police. He said he didn't molest Michelle. He said he didn't kill her. Instead, he has a question for police. Ask them if they are done with me or not, Norris said. They know where I'm at. Dot 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 I ain't hiding. A high chain link fence surrounds the school playground now. Michelle's photo is on a plaque at the entrance. Her death had a big impact on the city, Moran said. It hasn't gone away. Not even close. Another anniversary has passed. There are times I sit here, when it's quiet, and I think, Julia Tager Norris said. Arajo now has two daughters who are just a few years older than Michelle. He thinks about how their lives differ from Michelle's and how he wishes he could have helped her. Solving her case is something he can do. It's not an if. It's when, he said. Number 2. Bruce A. Szymanski, 49, was indicted on first-degree murder, first-degree felony murder, first-degree aggravated sexual assault, first-degree kidnapping, and third-degree possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose in the killing of 17-year-old Nancy Noga, Middlesex County Prosecutor Yolanda Sikon and Sayreville Police Chief John Zabrowski announced in a prepared statement Tuesday night. Szymanski was arrested Tuesday near his home by members of the Sayreville and Barnegat Police Departments and the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office after a brief foot pursuit, authorities said. He was being held at the Middlesex County Adult Correction Center in North Brunswick pending a detention hearing. Szymanski was partially identified as a suspect in the case through the use of genetic genealogy, authorities said. Noga, a high school senior, was reported missing on Jan 7, 1999, after she didn't return home from work at the Rag Shop store on Route 9 in Old Bridge. Five days later at approximately 8.57 a.m., her frozen body was discovered in a wooded area behind what was then Mini Mall Plaza Shopping Center on Ernston Road. She was found wearing a purple Arizona jacket, a dark V-neck sweater, blue flare jeans, black and white platform sneakers and carrying a purple backpack. An autopsy later determined Noga died from blunt force trauma. For more than two decades, the case remained open as investigators continued to investigate Noga's death. In the decades since Nancy Noga's death, law enforcement has relentlessly pursued justice on her behalf. The advancement of modern scientific tools has allowed that endeavor to enter a new chapter, Sikone said in the statement. This arrest is the result of decades of hard work by so many detectives and officers. We never stopped following up on leads, and today with the arrest of Bruce Szymanski, 
we are one step closer to bringing a degree of justice and closure to the family, added Zabrowski, who thanked Sikone and her office for their tireless efforts and partnership in bringing justice for this young girl. Friends described Noga as a nice, outgoing girl who was friendly and helpful. She had been involved in the school chorus before dropping out to work at the rag shop and old country buffet. Friends said she had plans to enter the military after high school and later attend college. Her disappearance and death rocked the blue-collar community. Friends recall how fear spread once her body was found, especially among girls in town who were afraid to walk alone at night. Serville police never gave up on the case. Zabrowski, who was one of the initial detectives investigating, has previously said that a week doesn't go by without a discussion on the case and ways to bring it to a successful conclusion. Szymanski's arrest follows a joint investigation conducted by Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office Detective Mark Morris and Sergeant Dean McCall, in conjunction with Serville Sergeant Daniel Elmere and retired Serville Detective Sergeant Richard Sloan. Assistant Prosecutor Scott LaMountain who serves as the section chief for the Major Crimes Unit, presented the case to the grand jury. The investigation is continuing. Anyone with information is asked to call Detective Morris at 732-745-3702 or Sergeant Elmere at 732-525-5406. Number 3. May 19, 2004 was a day like any other, and 21-year-old Jolliard student Sarah Fox left her apartment to go jogging in the nearby Inwood Hill Park for the last time. When she didn't return, fellow students immediately organized a large search operation with the police, manned telephone lines, and searched the park and surrounding areas. Six days after Fox disappeared, on May 25, 2004, one of the searchers made a horrific discovery, as the New York Post reported at the time. The young woman's naked decomposed body was found in a secluded wooded area of the park. Police believe she had been strangled before being placed in a ritual position with yellow tulip petals scattered around her. It's hard to imagine, but all the days she was missing, she was less than a mile from her home. A botanist examined one of the petals and said that it must have been picked between 24 and 48 hours before Fox's body was found. Since the advanced state of decomposition meant that the student had likely been murdered within hours of leaving her apartment, the killer must have returned to the scene. According to news.au.com, people from the neighborhood soon named a 39-year-old suspect who had a troubled history with other park visitors. His name was Dimitri Scheinman and his police interview was full of shocking statements and details. He claimed to have had psychic visions of the murder and told them elements of the crime, that had not yet been made public, a stick placed between the victim's legs and a broken rib, for example. However, there was no physical evidence to link Scheinman to Fox, and he was later released. Eight years after Sarah Fox's death, police followed up on a new lead as they found a chain at the scene of an Occupy Wall Street protest on March 28, 2012. While it's not clear why police tested the necklace for DNA, the results matched the DNA left at the scene. Only two months later, on July 13, however, the New York Daily News reported that the match was false. A NYPD lab technician had made a mistake. That summer was also when Dimitri Scheinman, who had since moved to South Africa, returned to New York City and immediately made headlines as he started to promote a book he was writing about the case. He also had an important message he wanted police to know. According to The Observer, he told them, that he had used his powers of clairvoyance to find out more about the crime in 2004. I had a vision of the killer grabbing her and punching her and, as a result, smashing her ribs. So I said maybe she has a broken rib, he said. He went on to give some more details, some of which were correct, some not. As Dnainfo reported, he also proudly presented police with a sealed envelope, which he claimed contained the name of Fox's murderer. However, this lead nowhere. The podcast True Crime, All the Time Unsolved insists that the man whose name was written down wasn't even in town at the time of the murder. Ever since 2004, the number one suspect in the case has been Scheinman, but he was never charged with a crime, as no physical evidence linked him to the killing. In December 2016, the case made its latest headlines as Lt. David Nilsson, 
who leads the NYPD cold case squad, told Daily News that they have a person of interest who wasn't Dimitri Scheinman. It may not be a total stranger attack, for all we know, it's someone she had a past relationship with many, many years before. Some people never forget. Today, it's been more than 17 years that Sarah Fox was brutally killed in the New York City park, and still no arrests have been made. Everyone seems to be at a loss, hoping that one day someone will finally come forward. Number 4. On January 22, 2010, seven-year-old Patrick assisted his foster mom, Labrata Moran, with household chores when at around 9 p.m. he decided to take out the trash. According to Staten Island Advance, he left the apartment in the Spring Creek Development Complex on the 100 block of Vandalia Avenue in Brooklyn and never returned. A massive search launched only 90 minutes after his disappearance. But nothing has been heard or seen of the little boy since, and his case remains a mystery. As the PIX11 reported, the boy was placed with his foster family three weeks before his disappearance. That's when he started to have a really hard time, as he missed his mother and couldn't communicate with Moran, who only spoke Spanish. He began to act out, started hurting himself, and kept threatening to run away to live with his mother Jennifer Rodriguez again. Rodriguez had previously lost custody of Patrick and his siblings after authorities arrested her on theft charges. As the Village Voice reported, Rodriguez was ordered to bring her son to a court hearing a few days later after one of Patrick's aunts claimed Rodriguez had planned on kidnapping the boy. But the mother was unable to do so because she allegedly did not know where he was. She was jailed for contempt but released shortly afterwards, having passed a polygraph test. To this day, she maintains her innocence and is convinced that her little boy simply ran away and hid somewhere. Several members of the boy's family started to accuse one another and were investigated following his disappearance, but nothing came of it. As the Atlanta Black Star and the Charlie Project reported, Rodriguez filed a federal lawsuit against New York City, the Administration for Children's Services, Axe, Patrick's foster mother, and the foster parents' apartment complex in October 2010. She claimed the Axe took Patrick from her without legitimate reason and that they were negligent in placing him in an unfit foster home rather than with relatives. In March 2011, a federal judge dismissed the lawsuit, but Rodriguez was allowed to sue individual caseworkers and St. Vincent's Services, the child care agency in charge of Patrick's case. In August 2018, the lawsuit was settled for $6 million. The funds will be used to aid in the search for Patrick and to benefit him if he is discovered alive. To this day, there have been no traces or clues as to what may have happened to the little boy. Now, he would be 18 years old, and his case remains unsolved. The last time Patrick was seen, he was wearing a red t-shirt, blue jeans, and black sneakers. He has black hair and brown eyes, was 4'8 tall, and weighed 65 pounds. He has a scar through his left eyebrow and a birthmark on his abdomen and goes by the nickname Lil P.